Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Kress. I'm a certified child life specialist and today I'm going to be talking to you about anxiety and resilience um, and supporting children through this experience we're going through called COVID. So a little introduction about myself, my background. Um, I was a college student at the University of Virginia when I learned about CHT. I, um, I was uh, introduced to CHT my um, very first year at UVA doing some service work there and then I joined a service fraternity and during that um, time with them, we did a lot of different service projects at Camp Holiday Trails. Um, and I just fell in love with the mission and the children that they served and the families. Um, and I became a counselor in 2007, and I was a counselor in 2008. And in 2009, I was one of the assistant program directors there. Um, and um, it just really inspired me. I just think that there's nothing like camp. As you can see from my ridiculous photos, um, camp will also always hold a special place in my heart because it's where I met my husband, um, who's the one dressed in green on the right. Um, and we now have a child, Benjamin, as well. Um, but in college, I felt like I was being, I was just drawn to working with children with special health needs. Um, and through my work at camp, it just inspired me so much that um, the impact that normalization and meeting peers with um, similar health issues and similar challenges, um, the impact that that can have on these kids and their families as a resource and as um, just a guiding tool throughout some of um, different challenges and, and stressors during development. Um, so anyways, after college, I um, began to pursue a career as a child life specialist, which many people uh, haven't actually heard about unless you've been uh, in a children's hospital. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what child life is. Um, so a certified child life specialist is a trained professional that has experience in helping children and their families cope with being in the hospital um, and helping them cope with illness and stressful life events. So we um, have to have certain coursework requirements that are including child development courses and um, different, let's see, we can show you the pictures there, um, different uh, things about biology and a, a class that's taught by a child life specialist. And then we complete clinical training. So you start as a volunteer and, and oftentimes people complete a practicum program. And then our clinical training is in a, a child life internship, which is at least 600 hours under a certified child life specialist. Um, and after that's completed, you do a certification exam. Um, so our role is in teaching children about their diagnosis, providing support during um, procedures and preparing them for what it's going to be like. Um, and then during the procedure itself, we're really there to promote their, their positive coping strategies and um, teaching them how to utilize deep breathing to relax their bodies or guided imagery to transport their minds um, somewhere much more fun and pleasant um, and maybe squeezing a stress ball or holding their parents hands so that ultimately we hope that they have a sense of mastery over that stressor. Um, we are also there to normalize the environment and support their normal development. And then um, we're in, kind of going along with that. We are in charge of volunteers and special events and um, all of the donations that come our way, um, which is a, a real blessing to have the support of the community. Um, we also have training to provide grief and bereavement support. So when a child is at the end of life or um, perhaps an adult is at the end of life and has young children, uh, we work with those families to help the children understand what's going on and to provide them um, with ways to cope um, with all of that that um, they're experiencing. And then overall, we're advocates for patient and family-centered care. So today's objectives, I really wanted to discuss with you all, um, how do you talk about coronavirus with your kids and teens? Um, it, you know, this has been going on for several months now, so I'm sure that, that most kids and teens have an idea of what's going on, but it's, um, it could still be extremely confusing, and we have um, different choices of language that we can use to help explain things to really clarify for their developmental level. 
Um, I want to discuss anxiety and grief um, in the age of COVID, um, how you can address tough questions, um, and different ways to promote coping and resilience, and then hopefully give you a few different resources and tools that you can use at home. Um, so the talk today really fits in with my career as a child life specialist because we work really hard to explain all kinds of diagnoses to children um, and a lot of resources out there have actually been developed by child life specialists. So I'm excited to share some of those today. All right, so we're going to start with, gosh, how do you discuss coronavirus? Um, so in general, when discussing hard topics and stressful topics with kids, we always encourage um, parents, caregivers, um, even healthcare workers to follow that child's lead. Ask him what he knows about what's going on. Ask him directly what questions he might have. Um, so really pay attention to what that child seems curious about or even worried about. Um, for young kids, they might not be able to verbalize this, um, and you might actually see it through play. Um, some of the things that they're concerned about or, or acting out um, through their play um, will become more apparent to you. Invite them to ask those questions and answer honestly with kind of um, concrete, simple terms. Um, but I think it's also important to model calmness when you're discussing these stressors. Um, the media uses a lot of fear tactics in how they present things. Um, and there is certainly a lot to be fearful about right now, but we as adults can model healthy coping. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk to you about that um, this evening. So um, in terms of honesty and facts, you always wanna present um, the truth to kids, because if you fudge the truth or you tell some white lies, those kids are smart and they're going to figure out um, that you didn't tell them what the truth was. Um, and they are, um, you know, that impacts their trust in what you're sharing with them. So um, but there is certain language that you can use that's less threatening um, and easier to um, process. So I would encourage you, especially for younger children, to use simple and concrete terms. So a sample script for this. <clears throat> would be something like coronavirus is a new sickness that's affecting people of all ages all over the world and because those germs are new germs and our bodies haven't seen them before. Um, it's a very contagious illness, which means you can catch it from other people. Um, it usually causes someone to have a fever, a cough, and a hard time breathing. Uh, it's called a pandemic because people all over the world are getting very sick from this virus. And then I would often add on, like, this is no one's fault. You didn't do anything wrong for this to happen, or even if somebody that you know gets sick, they didn't do anything wrong to get sick. Because um, so much is also being focused upon, you know, gosh, if you if you aren't wearing a mask or you aren't hand washing, um, but you know, sometimes kids will interpret those things and feel guilt for things like I wished that somebody had a bad day and then they got sick. Um, they can really kind of interpret things much more, much differently than adults. Um, I would also try to focus on like for, first responders and healthcare workers are really working hard and have the training um, to care for everybody. Uh, a suggestion for younger children would be to use bibliotherapy, and what that is is stories <clears throat> that have been written about a certain um, disease process or about a certain experience or even about emotions um, that can help a, children, a child identify with what's going on in the world and help them really navigate through some, some tricky situations by identifying with that character. Um, the next thing that's helpful to, to consider when you're discussing an illness with a child is um, talk about and validate emotions. It's okay for you as a grown-up um, to express emotions in front of your child. So um, you could even tell them, gosh, I'm feeling really anxious a lot about this virus. Um, it's normal to feel those things, to feel worried about what's to come, especially during these times that are so uncertain. You know, why don't you tell me how you're feeling? Are you feeling like me? Um, and just, you know, give them the opportunity to share what's going on in their mind. Um, let's see. Also, um, focusing on how they're helping and what there is to look forward to um, is a really awesome way to help kids feel empowered. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, just to backtrack a second, another thing when you're discussing this, this illness in particular um, 
and social distancing, and it kind of goes goes along with how children are are helping, how they're you know really making an impact in a positive way, and really talk about social distancing and how it's necessary to keep people safe. Explain um, more about how you know it's really a lot of the elderly folks who are at risk of getting really sick um, from this virus. Um, another thing that's important to talk about if your family is having some financial struggles, it's okay to talk about that with your kids and explain maybe your reason behind needing to curtail unnecessary spending. Um, but then again, you don't want to over worry your children about that strain because um, that's often you know, an adult's concern. So here's a few resources that I've found um, throughout the past several months that are helpful in talking to kids about coronavirus. So the CDC has um, a video on YouTube. Of course, there's probably a million videos by now, um, but I think that one's really credible. There's um, the Child Mind Institute has a lot of really awesome um, resources on their website about talking to children, um, but also some resources for the parents and caregivers. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry has some resources for helping kids and parents cope. Um, and then mindheart.com, or I guess .co's, um, they have this book that you can download that it helps explain the virus <clears throat> in a, a really nice and colorful way. Here's a few additional things. Pretty soon after the virus really um, exploded. NPR developed this little comic. It's called a zine or zine. I'm not sorry. I don't know how to say that. It's this little booklet and you can fold it up and it's like pocket sized. Uh, but that's a really nice little, <laughs> I'm being told it's a zine, um, little nice resource. And then the interagency standing committee has a storybook available in uh, several languages. Um, and they talk about coronavirus's impact um, across the world. So now I'm going to um, switch gears a little bit and talk about anxiety and grief in children. So we're just going to start with some definitions. Anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Hmm. That sounds like the situation we're in right now. So you might experience worry or fear about the short-term and long-term impact of the pandemic. How are we gonna protect ourselves? How are we gonna protect our loved ones? It just, the list can go on and on. And then grief is defined as a deep sorrow, especially um, one caused by someone's death. And the, um, certainly the nature of a person's attachments has an effect on their grief responses. And many of the losses are in COVID are very ambiguous and lack definition. Um, and we're truly grieving a living loss. So that's one that just keeps going and going and going without an end in sight. Um, I remember probably about a month into um, the stay at home order, I came across a, a really wonderful article about grief during the age of COVID. And it, I just hadn't even realized um, even as you know, working in, in this profession that what I was experiencing was truly grief because I was grieving the loss of normalcy. Um, and so I think that's what so many of us are, are going through. So any type of loss can trigger grief. Like I mentioned, we are really dealing with a collective loss of the world we once knew. Um, I'm referring to it as the olden days. Um, we're mourning not only the extreme loss of life, that has come with this illness, um, but also the loss of safety and just being able to go about our normal activities and routines. Um, we're grieving the loss of special events and graduations and birthdays and plans for the holidays and family gatherings. Um, there's just so much that um, has changed and it's impacted everyone. Um, as far as anticipatory grief, <clears throat> that's when you feel sadness over an impending loss or fear of what will happen or anger over everything and, and feeling isolated. Um, and so certainly it's like that living grief that I mentioned on the previous slide. It's, it's we're mourning what we have lost and what we anticipate losing in the coming months. Um, so we have to process both our own individual grief and our collective grief, all while still facing an uncertain future um, that we feel powerless and uh, to control. But the good news is that grief can respond to awareness to attention 
and to expression. And so we're going to kind of <clears throat> talk about um, still a little bit more about how this is impacting our children, but then different ways that um, we have the power to uh, make a difference. So in particular, children um, and teens, um, how this is impacting them, of course, they may not fully understand the illness and what, what's going on and its impact on our communities um, and the threat that, that looms. They may fear separation from caregivers and a lack of safety there. Um, certainly, if parents are stressed, that really gets projected onto the child. And if the parents are stressed about not only maybe job insecurity, <clears throat> finances, um, just the sickness and the illness, that will um, impact that child's stress experience as well. The change of routine. Routine is something when children are grieving or um, anxious is something at my work, I'm always encouraging parents to try to maintain some semblance of routine to help those children um, have outlets and feel secure and safe. Um, but right now, routines have, have been completely turned upside down. Um, you know, school was canceled, basically. <clears throat> Excuse me summer plans, camp. I mean, it, it's just, it's so much. And um, the kids are isolated from their peers, isolated from their, um, their valuable teachers and guidance counselors and other adults in their community. Um, and then of course, you know, their kids are dealing with the loss of all the celebrations and the milestones and the things to look forward to. Um, some other things that are not listed on the slide, but um, that certainly could lead to some anxiety and grief in kids during this time is stranger anxiety. So if they're sick and have to go um, to the doctor's office or the hospital, stranger anxiety is a big deal there. Um, lack of understanding of cause and effect. So young children um, don't understand really what illness is. So that goes back to the first bullet point, but also um, you know, they don't understand the real impact of of what washing their hands has and how that can make a difference. Um, and then being aware of and impacted by changes in family dynamics that may be presenting themselves. So what, what can we do? What are some tips? How do we help with this? So what I want you to focus on is what is your child really thinking? What are they truly worried about? Um, let them digest information with, your, with you and your family members and process through things together. Validate, um, validate and encourage their emotional expression. So rather than saying, don't worry about that, or that's a grown-up problem, you can say, I can tell you're really worried about what could happen. I would love to hear what you're thinking. And as I mentioned before, it's okay to show emotions in front of your kids, but also show them how you process those emotions and what coping strategies you use. So, man, I'm feeling really nervous. When I watch the news, I get really anxious and I'm noticing like my heart is pounding. Um, you know, something I do when I feel that way, I'm going to turn the news off. I'm going to go outside for a walk. I'm going to um, pet my dog. I'm going to journal and or draw. Um, so teach them what you do. You want to be patient, kind, and reassuring. Reassurance um, actually plays a really important role in helping kids um, cope with stress and anxiety. Um, promote a routine. Of course, I mentioned that before. And then some red flags that you do want to be aware of um, are changes in a child's mood or how they're eating or sleeping, what those patterns normally look like. Increased irritability, um, increasingly withdrawn or really lacking an interest in their usual activities, if they're increasingly aggressive or are really seeking reassurance like uh, way more than usual and they need you to, to answer a million questions um, and it's just kind of seeming very unusual for that child. Those are the times when I would really encourage you to seek some counseling. Um, I always think counseling is great and that you know we probably all would benefit from counseling, but certainly those types of red flag behaviors um, may indicate to you as a caregiver that it's probably time for your child to see um, a trusted counselor. And then find and promote some coping strategies that are gonna work for your kids and kind of have like a coping strategy catalog for us to go through in a little bit. Focus on what we can do and what we can be excited about and how we are helping. Um, a lot of stress comes when control is stripped away. 
and that's something that we um, really talk about a lot in the hospital because when you are sick and in the hospital, you have very, very little control over what's going on. You can't really pick, you know, whether or not you get to have to take a medicine or what you're wearing or who can, you know, um, come in your room. So we have to flip it and focus on what do you have control over? Well, you have control over what kind of games are available or um, what activity you want to do um, with your mom or, um, you know, do you want the doctor to look in your left ear or your right ear first? So we really try to focus on what are those small little things that you can have control over and um, that can play a really important role here as well. So next, I want to talk about addressing tough questions. So it's tempting to want to reassure your child that things are going to be better soon, um, even when you aren't really sure of that. Um, but I want to encourage you to like set aside a, a designated time every day and let the ch child or teen know like this is our time where we're going to vent about what's going on. This is our time when you can ask me questions if you're unsure. And if you don't want to ask anything during that time, that's totally fine. But if you do, I think that's, you know, that sets a little bit of routine to it. Um, you can en encourage them to ask you anything. And maybe you need to say rather than do you have any questions? And they say, well, no, you could say, gosh, what is something you're wondering about today? Or what is something that you're nervous or scared about? Um, and then it's okay if you as a caregiver don't know the answers to that. Um, you're teaching kids how to tolerate uncertainty and, and that that, you know, ways to reduce their anxiety and build resilience through that. Um, so when brainstorming some questions that you just might not know the answer to, well, how about asking, well, when's this going to be over? Well, sheesh, gosh, I wish I knew when this would be over. So saying I wish um, can often like, that's just, it's a really nice phrase to help kids feel like you're understanding what they're saying. Um, for instance, at the hospital, you know, some kid might say, oh, I hate this IV straw, you know, I, I want to take it out right now. And um, you can say, gosh, I really wish we could just send it to the moon. Um, and that shows that kid, man, I'm there with you. Unfortunately, that's not a choice right now. Um, so anyways, when will it end? I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, what about, well, how come Johnny's family, they're going, you know, to the playground or they're going to the beach um, why are we not able to leave our house? Um, one way you could address that is by talking about how families have different ways of doing things and different families have different needs. We can only decide what's in the best interest of our own families and how we can do our best to keep others safe based on the advice of experts. So we don't know whether those other, whether Johnny's family has a vulnerable family member or maybe you know, a child that has an underlying health condition who could get easily sick from this virus. But we know that we need to take extra care and precautions to stay safe. And that's why we've made these rules for ourselves. Um, so that's just kind of a sample of how you could address that concern. Um, what about the really, really tough question about death? That is something that um, is super intimidating and something in our culture that we don't really talk openly about. Um, but you know, research and studies have shown that the more honest you are about death and dying, and the, and you know, using care with your language, of course, um, but it helps kids understand the concept better and um, feel more comfortable expressing their concerns, so they're not bottling them up inside. So you know, if if <clears throat> my child were to ask me, well, will my grandfather die from this? You know, maybe try to figure out what are they really worried about? Did they hear about somebody else's grandfather dying? And gosh, um, that's really really sad news um, or you know what are you really thinking and worried about might happen and then you can just be honest you know it's true we all are going to die one day and so one day your grandfather will die but we don't expect that to happen for a really really long time he's in good health you know we're all taking these important precautions to keep um, keep everybody safe and to you know washing our hands and social distancing um, so you know I, I I'm glad that you're talking to me about that, but we don't expect that that will happen. Media exposure. This is a slide for me. 
as well. Um, research has shown that there is a link between watching the news of traumatic events and stress symptoms. That may not surprise you, but it is important in our current age where we are constantly bombarded with um, media to be aware that that really does impact stress levels. Um, and I, I found in my researching that graphic, the graphic quality of images ha plays a role in that as well. So if your children are watching CNN or whatever news station with you and they're seeing people being wheeled out on gurneys, um, they're seeing people hacking up lungs, that you know, those graphic images stick with them for a while and can um, lead to greater stress. Exposure to information about COVID through social media is associated with increased symptoms of anxiety as well. And there was a really recent study um, that just demonstrated that. The World Health Organization has called this an infodemic and stresses the importance of dispelling misinformation and promoting accurate information. So what I would advise is that you set limits um, for not only for your kids and teens, but for yourself as well. Um, the appropriate amount of exposure depends on a child's age. So it's helpful to limit media exposure, especially for younger children. Um, and then when, you know, with your older children, watching it with them, parental monitoring and guidance can help them navigate the confusion and often scary news that they're um, witnessing. And then please have media-free zones and family discussions because that is going to be the most important um, key. So now, whew, that was a heavy load. Now we're gonna talk about um, promoting coping and resilience. Um, so as I mentioned, it is totally normal to feel anxious and worried about what's to come. Um, situations like this are certainly stressful for each and every one of us. And now more than ever, we need to help our kids navigate these difficult obstacles and adversities and help them build resilience. So uh, thank you, Wikipedia. I stole some definitions. Um, so coping is to invest one's own conscious effort to solve personal and interpersonal problems in order to try to master, minimize, or tolerate stress and conflict. Resilience is the ability to mentally or emotionally cope with a crisis or to return to pre-crisis status quickly. It exists when the person uses mental processes and behaviors in promoting personal assets and protecting self from the potential negative effects of stressors. So in other words, resilience is the process of effectively negotiating, adapting to, or managing significant sources of stress or trauma and incorporating it into your personal and collective narrative. It also involves protective, attenuating, and recovery fa factors and incorporates resources across several domains, personal, relational, and environmental. So I borrowed that from a website. Anywho, resilience is our ability to thrive or bounce back after a stressful situation. And sheesh, we could all use that. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Um, one of the first <clears throat> uh, suggestions is through reassurance. So Young children especially are very egocentric. So hearing about the mounting death toll in the news can make them really worried um, that they're gonna catch coronavirus, especially um, the coverage of the new MISC, I believe it is, the syndrome that's affecting children. So it's helpful to reassure your child that very few kids are getting really sick from this. Um, and again, focus on all those precautions that you're taking. So reassurance would be modeling emotional expression which we've talked about. We all have questions and fears, and how can we support each other and get answers and cope with these feelings? Providing appropriate information, like we mentioned earlier, and empowerment. So focus on what you're doing as a family to stay safe and how you're helping others. Um, <clears throat> so that's like the washing your hands. Um, how can you get the ch child to participate in that? Maybe you need to pick a new 20 second song and switch it up every you know, few days. Um, we really need, you know, focusing on, we really need everyone to do their part and your role in washing your hands is so important. Um, focusing on how you know, adults are really doing what they need to do to keep that safety um, maintained. And then another suggestion I saw was involving the children in um, picking out family masks, which I thought was cute. Or you can even get masks that you can de decorate yourself. So we really are aiming to provide hopeful messages. And what can we look forward to? Even if it's just having a picnic in our yard on Friday or camping in a tent in 
our yard <laughs> on Saturday or having a movie night. So another suggestion in addition to reassurance is routine. Routine, routine, routine is so important. Um, these kids have routine when they're in school. Um, it helps them know what to expect and gives them a sense of safety. I'm sorry, this turned out super blurry, but you can kind of get the sense of um, having some sort of a daily schedule and involve the children in making the schedule. And um, of course, you can have flex days where you're not sticking to the hour mark, but I think it's kind of um, important to have something to anticipate coming. Um, and then making some sort of a visual representation for your family to, to be able to access. Regulation is also very important in developing resilience. So that's, again, validating emotions. Y'all have heard me say that umpteen times, discussing your thoughts and feelings. And then we need to find some activities that help these kids process what they're going through. And then again, limiting media. It is super exciting that resiliency, that's my dog, resiliency can be taught. So as a parent or a caregiver, you can help promote your child's emotional well-being by engaging them in an environment full of opportunities to learn helpful skills to becoming resilient. Isn't that great news? And resilient kids tend to be happier, more motivated and engaged and to adopt a more positive attitude about difficult or challenging situations. The, um, Thing that I love the most about working with children in my career is how resilient they are. They teach me every day the power of a positive attitude. So some, some skills, um, some resilient skills would be the ability to identify emotions, um, the ability to regulate emotions, uh, having several coping skills in your back pocket, practicing mindfulness, and then expressing gratitude. So protective factors of things that can help children become resilient. Um, these are defined as characteristics of the child, the family, and wider environment that reduce the negative effect of adversity on child outcome. So a number of, of different factors, including a child's IQ, their emotion regulation, their parenting, the low parental discord, advantaged SES, effective schools, and safe neighborhoods are all associated with positive outcomes. But every child doesn't have all of those um, factors. So what else tends to be important? Per the Center for Childhood Resilience, the Centers for Disease Control has identified the presence of at least one safe, stable, and nurturing adult, just one, as the most important protective factor for children and young people in the face of stress and adversity. I think that is amazing. That's the impact of one safe, stable person on a child's entire life. Additional protective factors include adaptive skill building and opportunities to strengthen their self-regulatory capacities, the building a sense of self-efficacy and perceived control, and then positive experiences and mobilizing the sources of hope, faith, and cultural traditions. So, teaching resiliency. You wanna be able to provide opportunities for your child to have that sense of control and a sense of success. When a child is in um, the school age years, you know, they really become focused on product and on goals and on um, kind of details and in being successful. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we are gonna be seeking out. We're focusing on what you can do, how you are helping and what you can be hopeful for. So next, um, I borrowed this from the Children's Hospital of Orange County's blog, and they have a full week's worth of activities for families to how to teach your children um, to be resilient. So I'm starting on Monday. Um, this schedule provides some consistency, structure, and predictability, right? When you, when you make a schedule. Um, when we don't know what the world is gonna throw at us, building in some routine and predictability serves as a buffer from some outside chaos is what their blog had said. Um, so you wanna of course collaborate with your kids to create a weekly family schedule and give them some, some control and influence. So make a simple schedule, establish you know bedtimes. That might be a little bit flexible for teens. 
Um, maybe some snacks and meals in there. Physical activity, keep it up. Get some exercise, you know, walk around uh, the neighborhood. Maybe do some schoolwork. Ugh. I know it's summer, but maybe some kind of reading time would be great or, you know, even keeping up on your multiplication tables. Uh, <laughs> maybe you can play number munchers. That's a fun game. Um, and then build in 30 to 60 minutes for these activities that are going to be mentioned in the next several slides for the rest of the week. Uh, a suggestion was that each member of the family identifies five self-care activities and those get added to the schedule as well. So uh, some ideas were maybe going for a walk or gardening or drawing as a family. All right, Tuesday. Tuesday's focus is on emotion identification. So um, a suggested movie night. So maybe many of you have watched Inside Out and that's a really great movie um, to help kids kind of identify various emotions. And then you can make it a, you know, build a fort and have special snacks. And then after the movie, you could draw the feelings that you've experienced um, in, the, in that day or in the past week. Talk about what do those feelings look like? What would it be, um, what would it say if it could talk? Or what does that feeling need to feel better or safe? So there's a few suggestions of art activities where you could actually draw freehand 10 emotions or you could use magazines to cut up and make a collage. And um, it has been shown that kids who can identify their own emotions adjust better to challenges and are able to communicate their needs more effectively, which sounds awesome. And then um, you would hang up the art and refer to it throughout the week. Man, I'm feeling sleepy today because I didn't sleep well last night or I am so distracted today because there's just a lot going on. Um, I liked this little image. Again, it's blurry. I apologize. But um, you could just check off all the things that you're feeling. On Wednesday, we're going to focus on coping skills, which are ways to manage all of those big emotions that you practiced identifying on Tuesday. So um, we'll start with deep breathing. There are actually a lot of apps and videos online to demonstrate how to practice deep breathing with your child. There's the Calm app, there's the Headspace app, <clears throat> which actually has some really nice materials on it. Um, and then there's one called the Virtual Hope Box. But if you're trying to steer clear from screen time because your kids are getting enough of that anyways, some simple things like bubbles or pinwheels or imagining blowing out birthday candles, or you could even imagine like blowing a kite across the room. Um, and then there's one called butterfly and warrior breathing, which I'm sure if you Googled, you'd find a, a cute little video. Um, but it's really about like expanding your chest and you hold your arms um, at 90 degrees from out in front of you and um, open them up wide, kind of like butterfly wings and then close them as you breathe in and out. Uh, so there's the butterfly one, or you can imagine it like a warrior and kind of determine the difference between how the two make you feel strong and you know, um, sturdy and brave, um, or the butterfly gentle and peace and calm. That's how I feel at least. Um, and then model by sharing how you felt before you did your deep breathing exercises and how you felt after. It's really important to practice all of these coping skills um, when you're feeling calm in the first place because kids will get used to it and comfortable with the practice. So then when they're in a crisis or they're in a moment of stress, they know how to fall back on those techniques. And it's not something you're trying to teach them in a hurried, frantic moment. Progressive muscle relaxation. Um, again, there's so many really cool scripts and videos online uh, that you can use, but it's really about making you know, tensing your muscles and then relaxing. And you do it from either like toes all the way up to your head or head all the way down to your toes. Uh, and I liked this little uh, phrase that you could use with younger kids. It's like making your muscles go from hard, uncooked spaghetti into relaxed noodles. And um, that's another really, really cool and helpful uh, strategy. Then grounding. Grounding is like bringing your attention to the present and is something that I know I need to focus on a lot with myself. Um, so some suggestions on how to teach that skill to children is, um, one is you can take your five senses on a scavenger hunt. So what are five things you see in this room? 
What are four things you feel? What are three things you hear? What are two things you smell? What is one thing you taste? Another idea is counting backwards by, from 100 by intervals of like one or two or three or seven, which is quite challenging maybe for an older kid or teen to uh, just kind of get their mind focused on one thing. You could name as many colors as you can in 60 seconds or even recite lyrics to your favorite song. So those things take practice. And then guided imagery, music and dance can also be really wonderful, helpful coping skills um, to use. And again, there's a, a lot of really cool guided imagery scripts online that you could print off and just have available or a YouTube video that you just have saved um, that you can pull out in a moment of stress. All right. This one might be one of my favorites <clears throat> because it just reminds me so much of my work um, at the hospital. I have this Mary Poppins bag filled with anything and everything that I think could help a child cope with a painful or stressful procedure. So this is like making your very own um, distraction bag or box at home. So uh, it can include tools that different family members can utilize when they're feeling stressed and should be located maybe somewhere where everyone can access it. So you could just get like a shoe box or maybe if it were me, I'd probably need a bigger box because I have so many things I'd want to put in it. Um, but decorate the outside of the box and start putting things in. And you can even refer to your five senses and items that feel soft or taste good or smell soothing. Uh, and everyone can have some input on here. So some examples that they included were uh, maybe a soft stuffed animal that you could squeeze, uh, a nice smelling candle or lotion, some gum to chew, Play-Doh, I love Play-Doh, a bottle of bubbles, a pinwheel, some stress balls, and um, maybe a word search or a coloring page. There's lots of online visual calming tools or maybe a mandala that you could, could draw. Um, and then encourage it to be used when that child's feeling stressed. Maybe they just need to take a few moments with the coping box um, and see how that works for them. Friday. So on Fridays, the focus um, is conflict resolution. So another way of teaching your child conflict resolution skills is to teach them when and how to ask for help. So feeling connection is super important right now. Kids are being isolated from people that they might normally have confided in, whether it's friends or other family members or even teachers. So you want to start a conversation and, and make a family helping plan together. That's one way to teach this. So you can have each person uh, write out who they would go to when they're feeling mad or sad or happy or anxious. Um, you can tell them they can go to anyone, but maybe there's a specific person in the family that understands that certain emotion better. They could even call or FaceTime somebody that's not at home or maybe even talk to their dog and um, <laughs> someone that could comfort them. You could also make a connections calendar and include windows of maybe 15 minutes of your child's time to connect with someone on their social support list, like a grandparent or a friend, and then um, just try to be creative with this. Now, some suggestions I saw for conflict resolution if the family is having, you know, some stressful arguments um, is really work to determine what it is that you're upset about. Discuss one issue at a time, which I thought was really interesting and makes a lot of sense. Be careful not to use degrading language and to keep your voice calm. Use I statements, so expressing your own feelings and taking responsibility for them. Give everyone a turn to speak um, and don't stonewall, which I think is really important like don't just walk away or shut down like you everybody needs to to have an op opportunity to speak and share taking a time out if things get heated that's um really important because as you know in the hind brain that you know fight or flight sometimes we say things that we're not meaning to say um so if things start to ramp up maybe just saying okay i'm aware that this is happening we're gonna just take a few minutes and we're gonna come back gather our thoughts and remember that the goal is a productive and healing conversation where you're working towards compromise or a shared understanding. And Saturday. So Saturday's focus is going to be on mindfulness. And as I mentioned a bit ago, practice, practice, practice. Um, we want to choose where we want to put our attention. 
or sorry, choosing where we want to put our attention helps us then choose how we want to think about it. What a cool statement. Um, so here are a few ideas. <clears throat> the first is mindful listening. So the, the blog, I'm just, again, borrowing from that, but I thought it was really wonderfully put. So here's an idea is to sit on the floor facing your child. You can sit on a cushion um, and then you could use like a, a bell or one of those singing bowls and you can actually just borrow the sound from a YouTube video, but if you have one, that's even better. And it helps you um, would ring it or sing it to call your child into focus and attention and then encourage them to listen to that bell until it's no longer chiming or singing. It might only last a few seconds, but those seconds of their complete attention is very powerful. Make it a game and have them raise their hand when they can't hear it anymore and see who has the better hearing. What a neat idea. So that just really teaches them just even if for a few seconds how to focus their attention on one thing. How about going for a mindful walk? So you could even just walk around your house or apartment and, and notice every step you're taking. Notice how the floor feels under your feet, how your legs feel as they move, and what noises you hear around you as you take, take each step slowly. Pay as much attention as you can to the experience. That's really what mindfulness is about, is really focusing your attention on the moment. Remember to ask the child how he is feeling before and after to see if it made a difference for him. Mindful eating, that's something I'm working on. Um, so just having a snack in a mindful manner, or maybe even just the first bite. So the, um, <laughs> the example they have here is if the snack is an apple slice, have your child examine the apple as if they are an alien from outer space seeing that apple slice for the first time. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? Does light shine through it? Take a small bite, but don't swallow it just yet. What is this bite like? Chew it slowly, take it all in. And then talk about that bite. What are new things they discovered about the apple? I think that's really interesting. Another mindfulness activity is called loving kindness meditation, and that's the practice of sending positive thoughts and wishes to yourself and others. It's, you know, that's a really powerful meditation right now, especially since we can't be with a lot of the people that we love. We can send them mind messages and kindness and well wishes. So close your eyes, imagine that the person or pet you care about um, is there with you and say aloud or silently, may you be safe. May you be healthy and strong. May you be happy. May you be peaceful and at ease. And these wishes you can send to yourself too. Have your kid pick four wishes they would like to send and practice saying these with them. We can send wishes to people all over the world, even people that we don't know. Um, but as we do know, people around the world are impacted by COVID-19. Science has shown that the power of thought can change how we feel and lead to changes in those around us. So if we engage in positive thinking, we can find ourselves and others around us in a positive mood. Gratitude. This is such a simple thing to do, but can make such a big difference. So to end the week on this great note, you can engage in practicing gratitude for all the things that we do have and that we do get to experience. So um, research has shown that teaching gratitude to kids increases their happiness, their optimism, and their generosity, um, which is just so fabulous. So the first um, idea is mealtime gratefulness sharing. So you could start a new family tradition before each meal where each um, individual gets to say at least one thing that they're grateful for. Um, <laughs> so that could be anything from, I'm grateful that, you know, I had a dream about uh, flying to outer space last night, or I'm grateful that I got to have my dog um, sit next to me while I played video games. Or I'm grateful that mom helped me find this awesome YouTube video this morning. The next is a gratitude journal. So you could encourage your family members or your, you know, to keep, I guess your kids too, of course, um, to keep a gratitude journal and write down three things every day that they're grateful for. And then at the end of the week, everyone gets to share. The next idea was a gratitude jar. So you would, in that case, um, just write all of those things down and uh, put it inside 
a jar or a small box. And then anytime you're feeling down, you can just pull out one of those strips of paper um, when you need a little extra encouragement. Some other inspirations for that can be empowering quotes that remind you of somebody or things you are grateful for about um, a specific person or a positive memory. And then the last idea for promoting gratitude is to write down some mantras so or positive affirmations. Um, and you put them somewhere visible in the house, put them on the fridge, put them on a mirror um, and practice reciting them. So a few favorites are this too shall pass, with change comes opportunity and I will be okay. Whew. So that was a lot of ideas. Um, and here are some of the fabulous resources that I have found. Some of them I have mentioned already. Um, there's a Center for Childhood Resilience. They have a lot of really great resources, as does the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. If, um, if you have experienced um, a loss of a loved one or are really um, struggling through some tough grief, there, the Center for Loss and the Dougie Center have some really amazing resources. The Dougie Center, I use a lot of their handouts in my work when there um, is a child or an adult who is at end of life or has died. Uh, they have some really great specific to COVID resources, um, including ones on how to support children when, uh, when a loved one is dying from afar. Um, so like how a lot of times kids now can't go visit loved ones in the hospital or, um, or maybe can't go to a nursing home to visit a grandparent. They, um, they have some really well thought out and, and beautiful um, suggestions for how to manage those situations. There's a website called Kids Health, which has, if you don't know about it, it's really awesome. They have information on different diagnoses and teaching kids about the body um, and they have it in separated into three tabs so there's one for parents there's one for kids and one for teens and it's the information is written in developmentally appropriate language for that um, population some more resources um, some that i in particular, I want to point out the Child Life Disaster Relief has some resources on how to help children cope and find um, and resilience uh, activities that um, are specific to COVID. Project Sunshine has some really cool lists of age appropriate activities that are accessible to anyone with internet. Um, and those things are everything from like story time online to games, um, to just a variety of art activities, all kinds of different suggestions by age group, which I thought was really cool. Uh, there's the Calm meditation app and some other um, like apps focus on the go and headspace, and then several books that can help teach resilience. So just to recap, everyone has been greatly impacted by COVID. Caregivers and the community at large have a responsibility to teach our youth to recognize their emotions and find ways to cope with uncertainty. This requires intentionality and hard work as well as time designated for self-care. A supportive, involved adult plus some mindfulness and meditation are a recipe for resilient kids. So that concludes the presentation today. I hope you all um, found a few little nuggets that you'll take back to your families um, and share. But if you have any questions, please, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'd be happy to speak with anyone further on this topic. And I hope you guys um, stay well and um, enjoy this time together with your family. Thank you.